It is the cry of our heart that Thee would come and lead us in this service. We thank Thee that Thou art already leading. We pray now that we shall follow. We believe, O Lord, that in this service can be the change that we've been looking for in an entire lifetime. Who knows but what we've been called to this royal position for such a time as this. We're praying, Lord, that the kingdom of God will come to earth as it is in heaven. We're praying, Lord, as thee makes thyself manifest, that we will follow thee and that we will, O Lord, be infused with the divine nature. That, O Lord, that we will be cleansed and purged in this service and that we will be like Jesus to a greater and more significant degree. We pray that we may hear the voice of the Apostle John who spoke into the, into the church at Ephesus that we were to love each other. Little children love one another. And then he also said in his first letter that we were to walk on earth like Jesus walks. We were to be like him. So Jesus, we know that within our own fallen self, it is an impossibility. But recognizing that, we repent and ask for cleansing. And then we pray that we will be strengthened to obey thee, for there is further cleansing. And you take out of us that which was uh, given to us in in the fall, and you make us like unto the Son of God. We pray that the, the face of Christ will be seen in the remnant here. We pray, Lord, that today in our lives, that our hearts will be so open unto Jesus 
and be so filled with love one for another, especially for the least especially for the one that has bothered us the most, especially for the one who has seemed to give us the most difficulty. For it is that point that we've needed the victory. And it's that point that our prayers either get, uh, remain in the room or get out. So we're praying, Jesus, that our hearts will be overflowing with love for each person. And that, Lord, we may recognize our battle never has been with flesh and blood but has always been with principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world and the wicked spirits that gather in heavenly places, never with flesh. So, Jesus, we've had our eye on the wrong thing many times. Oh, Lord, help us not to, uh, to blame the wife or the husband or the child or the aunt or the uncle or the other preacher or this preacher or Sunday school teacher or leader or someone on the margin. Help us to realize that problem has always been self and that, that contentment is to be had in any set of circumstances where we've repented and where we're waiting upon God and looking to Him and depending upon Him with all of our hearts, then we can have contentment and our peace ought to be and shall be as great as a river. And so, Lord, grant us today that peace which is beyond understanding. And let the blood of Jesus Christ be sprinkled over this place and let the prayers that have been prayed now be effective in this auditorium for we know, Lord, that every every service is one before the service. Doesn't make any difference what we do in this service uh, as a rule. It's been one here on Saturday night and it's been one in our prayers and our personal devotions or we've lost it before we've ever begun. So we're praying, Lord, we plead the blood and we plead what's been made effective for us already for whatsoever has been ordained in heaven shall now be ordained on earth. We bind the powers of darkness and we Release, we release, O oh Lord, the light of God by God's grace and mercy through the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is in His name that we pray. It is in His name that we rejoice. It is in His name that we acknowledge our dependence upon Him. In Jesus' name we pray. And Lord, we would pray today the prayer uh, together that you taught us to pray that all men may speak words to God. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you turn to number four in your hymn book for the first hymn this morning? Number four. Praise the Lord, ye heavens adore him.
one of the greatest hymns that's ever been written in all of history. We sing it here often, and it's number eight. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Number eight. seated as the sanctuary choir leads us in further praise. The first song they're singing is, uh, well, it's a favorite of almost everyone, but it seems like it's been so special here through the years. Jesus paid it all.
Savior. this next one it could be that somewhere in the service the Holy Spirit might be thank you for your ministry today praise the Lord
praise the Lord for his help this morning. Today is a special day for some. We want to honor three of our young people this morning. And uh, one is not here, but uh, we'll ask Toby Wells and Jan Smiley to come up front here. If you will do that now. Melissa Kidd is not with us today, but we want to honor her. She's graduating this year. These are young people that are graduating from high school. And I'm pretty excited about uh, these young people. Ron, you can tell Melissa we love her, and I have a book here I want to give to her this morning. You can take to her. I want to praise the Lord for Jan and for her life and what she's demonstrated to us. She's graduated from high school, but uh, greater than that, she has taught us something. Some years ago, I began from time to time visiting Jan in, in the hospital, and uh, even though she's been through great difficulties, she's kept a smile on her face, and she's looked up rather than be discouraged or be depressed. And I want to praise the Lord for that because she's been an example to us, and therefore she's been a leader to us. Not just young, but old and young alike, adults and young people. Through her life, she's a demonstration to us. I want to praise the Lord for Toby and for what he's given to us. Even though God has blessed him in accomplishments in sports, I want to praise the Lord for the humbleness that he's had and, and for the respect that he's demonstrated, and not just to myself, but for the pastors and the leaders here. And he's also a leader. And sometimes you're a leader whether you want to be or not, just by who you are. And I want to praise the Lord for their lives and what they represent and for this time where the next few years they're going to need our prayers. Very much because what takes place in the next months and years of their lives will determine the rest of their lives. And they need our prayers very much. And that God will help them and to make the right decision. We have a book by Dr. Trueblood, A Place to Stand. And probably more than anything in today's life, we need a place to stand. And may God help you. And we want to honor you this morning for your accomplishments. Amen. Since the Holy Spirit, by God's grace, in their lives. We want to uh, announce in our bulletin, we want to be considering and praying about going on our next trip to Israel, September the 29th through October the 7th. If you're planning to go on this special pilgrimage, please submit your name and $100 deposit to Sandy Chittam. Also, uh, Pastor Barry mentioned to me a few minutes ago, with summer coming, many are busy, but there's also a need for, during the summer, for volunteers for daycare. Some may have an opportunity where they didn't have during the school year, so if it's possible, if you could check with him. But there's a very large need there, so if you can contact Barry if you're, the possibility is available for you. Ushers, will you please come forward to receive our morning tithes and offerings? Amen. 
O oh Lord, our God, we pray that our hearts will be awakened before that of Jacob's. Yes. For when he found that God was in that place, he arose, anointed it, and said, I will give my tenth. Mm. We're thankful for Abraham's response when he met Melchizedek. For he tied to him of all of his spoils. O oh Lord, we give to thee, not only because the tenth is yours, but we give in recognition that we have been placed as stewards over all that's given to us. And so, Father, we sanctify both tithe and offerings in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Perhaps that beautiful piece was played just for the reading of this letter. This letter is rewritten at my request because I destroyed the first copy. Sometimes if you ask me to pray for something that's close to your heart and very important, in order that that piece does not fall into anyone else's hands, I'll put it through the shredder. And uh, because uh, it could go to the dump or it could go somewhere and it could there be something that's so close to your heart. And there was a prayer request involved in this letter. So I read the letter and began to pray and then I destroyed it. But the substance of it uh, was so wonderful that I wanted to share it with you because I felt like it was worth 20 years of being at Scott Depot. Any one of you are worth that. My life is worth that. But it really is brought into focus when you hear something like I'm about to read. And so I read a letter that I'm not even sure what's going to be said because this is the second writing and it may not be like the first, but it, it's, it's wonderful, I'm sure. 
the essence of it will be here. Pastor Hogue, this was written yesterday at 2 p.m. at my request. It will really take God's help to ever tell again what has happened. It is still just as real and wonderful. God gave me the most wonderful promise this morning as I read in Psalms chapter 115, which says, The Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. I claim this also. That's wonderful, isn't it? That's what Joseph's name means. My story began several weeks before the missions convention. I knew I could not attend all meetings, but felt no real burden about it. That means that she had done all she could do, and therefore she had to rest about it, and that's the thing to do. I would just do my best. As it turned out, the Sunday evening service was the only one I got to attend from the beginning to the end, and it was a great service. But while Reverend Schultz was speaking, he said, the only way we were ever going to be twice. In our day, it sounds so extreme because since we have debunked the Pope, we have all made ourselves Popes. And God's grieved with us very much because we not only will not recognize illegitimate authority, whatever that is, but we will not recognize the authority that God's really put within us. It's very difficult in this day to read those words in a wedding ceremony. When the, when the woman comes to the part, I will obey, it almost brings a freeze up anymore, which of course does not mean in inequality in any way, but it means as it did for Christ, as Christ submitted himself to the Lordship of God the Father, so the wife submits herself to the Lordship of the man in the home. And so regardless of the atmosphere of the world and regardless of the, of the terrible mindset we have, God's word will always stand true as to what's right and to what's right in authority and how we should be led. And so she's referring to this. This great German <laughs> has yielded his life so much that you and I could see the difference in the last few years. As he stood here, a man who's escaped both from the Nazis and the communists, and he talked to us. He had no fear of man whatsoever. And he's talented enough to make it on his own until chaos, and that always follows making it on your own. But he submits himself to the lordship of Christ. We gave ourselves first to the Lord and then to those who have been assigned as our leaders. And this is the context of her writing here. She said that he made it clear that as God leads his servant, we must follow. And she said, uh, she writes, by reading a voice in the wilderness, by praying faithfully and supporting him, in every area. She said, this touched my heart so strongly. That means the Holy Spirit confirmed the truth and operated within her. This touched my heart so strongly that I made a vow I would, by God's grace, endeavor to do just that. I think it's remarkable that Brother Helms never asked us to follow him. He does only what Paul did in the Ephesian letter. In the Ephesian letter, Paul said, Be ye followers of God as dear children. That's all he's ever asked us to do. Praise the Lord. But there's still the scriptural principle of following the parent, of following the pastor, and of following especially someone who has been sent of God as his representative on this earth. Pastor Wormbrand said to me, he says, why did you leave your denomination? That's a good question because he's still Lutheran. He didn't leave his. Well, he had me on the spot. Since he was my elder, I, I needed to answer him. I needed to have some kind of answer because he was my elder as he is yours, whether you recognize it or not. And I said, well, Pastor Wormbrand, you answered that in your own book. He said, I did. And I said, yes, sir, it's right here, reaching toward the heights. And so he said, well, show me that. And I opened the book 
I opened it like that. It says right here, sir, you said, the church is our mother. And God is our, the Holy Spirit is our father. And God is our father. You said, but the church is filled with erring men. And sometimes she goes mad and goes astray. But God, our father, never does. If, if the mother goes mad and goes astray, be sure and follow the father. Be sure and follow the Holy Spirit. I said, sir, by God's grace, I followed the Holy Spirit. He said, you've answered my question well. Thank you for that. He put it back up. I said, you know, if anybody try to get me to follow other than Jesus and, and be allegiance to anybody other than his servants, that I'd have to say, like Peter, I'd, like, I'd have to say, I must obey God rather than men. And so, by God's grace, Pastor Wormbrand had given us that answer. And I was thankful for that. I never forget Malcolm Muggridge saying to me, and I will be with him in just a few days in London, England. I said to him, also our elder, and that may astonish some of you because he's a prominent Roman Catholic uh, member. But my friends, my friends, and my friends, who cares? God bless him in the Roman Catholic Church. Even as Mother Teresa is blessed, all I know, he is, has authority over me. And I said, just as Dr. Trubla does, and I said, Dr. Muggridge, I said, what would you, what would you have us do? Those of, you, those of us who are your juniors and we have, we, what legacy do you have for us? See, we'll see him in a few days, God keeping him alive. He'll be almost 90 years of age. Here's, the, here's probably, well, he's one of the most brilliant men in all the world. Yet he's one of the most childlike. As great as our William Buckley is, he's got a better mind than Buckley's. See, there's few in the world that can compete with the tremendous power of his mind. I think only E. Stanley Jones had a mind as good as Malcolm Muggeridge. Up in the prisons, the boys that read and study Mark and Doyle that you wrote to, they, when I said Muggridge, I tell you, those boys came alive. They said, you know Muggridge? I said, I'll be with him in a few days. And I mean, they were listening. Now, this was an atheist and a Buddhist. But they knew that Muggridge was one of the best minds on this earth. Dr. Muggridge, what would you leave? What is your legacy for us? We were in his little humble place study called the Ark. There was President Reagan's picture. There was the Pope's picture. There was all these people to Malcolm, to Malcolm. And I mean the stars of the earth acknowledging the greatness of this man. Mean thing to him, he was glad to have there. But he, he wasn't puffed up over it. He wore an old coat that was sewed over it. He had socks on that fell down on the shoes. And... <laughs> When you get that big, you can wear anything about what you want to. Uh, well, when you get when you get to that area, it doesn't matter what you do, really, as far as dress is concerned. But I tell you, the care of his soul. He's very Tolstoyan, very much like Tolstoy, and he's an authority on Tolstoy and Solzhenitsyn. He looked at me with eyes that are as clear as Brother Ham's, and he said to me, "And that's clear. It's the only other set of eyes I've ever seen that clear." He looked at me and he said, love Jesus Christ with all your heart. Take all your problems to him. He has never failed. Well, that may not mean as much as it should to a Christian congregation, but I want to tell you something. When I gave those boys in the prison that, I'll tell you, it put electricity in their soul. They looked at me like that. If God didn't land something in my lap, you're going to see him in a few days. Yes, and this is the message he has for me and for you. And they listened. A Buddhist that had killed three men and an atheist that had killed one that's hoping to get out of the prison this summer and go abroad with you and with me. If he gets out this summer, we're taking him to Israel. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I said, gentlemen, if God do a miracle for you and get you out of this prison, would you go abroad with us? They said, we will go. So if he gets them both out, you've got one Buddhist and one atheist going. Are you ready? By God's grace... <laughs> oh, well, I better get going. I'm not near to my sermon, but you know God's helped us. This, aren't you glad she wrote this letter? I wouldn't have ever said that. Praise his holy name. She said, 
by reading a voice in the wilderness and praying faithfully and supporting him in every area. Then she said, this touched my heart so strongly that I made a vow I would by God's grace endeavor to do just that. On Monday after everyone had left, I got out my book and it was though I had never read a page of it before. See, that's happened to me. I've, I've read it five times, the Bible almost twice in one year while I've been in a year of prayer and I've read a voice five times. And I open it, I say, Jesus, where was I when that was written? I've been through this book 20 to 30 times. Where in the world was I when this was written? Well, when, when a life is truly dedicated and anointed, uh, then it's fresh because it's anointed and God has given the words by God's grace. She said, I, as I read the pages, I had questions answered, prayers answered, and the, uh, and the most wonderful peace all from this book. I read without seeking. Now, by the way, she has such an anointing on her that she has an anointing on her father like few I've ever seen in this life. If you've ever seen him testify in the old days, he, when the glory get on him, he's, he wasn't even five foot tall, but when the glory get on him, he would hit his foot like a, he would hit his foot like a, I thought it was like a holy rabbit. He would thump. It was great power upon him. And, uh, well, we'll just have to wait to heaven and see what Dad's like because he's just one of the best men there ever was. She said, this went on each day as I got quiet and sat down to read and meditate. She said, this is very hard on me to sit down and be still. Well, that's just all of us, don't you think? When I think there's so much to do, but I put things aside and vowed again to be faithful. On Thursday, May the 11th, I just started reading when I turned to page 178 in chapter 18 and the last two times said that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. I immediately threw both hands in the air for, uh, for very audibly in my heart, Jesus said, ask. It, I, I was uh, though, as though, it was though he was at my, my side. It was my hand still waving in the air. I quickly made four petitions to the Father. <laughs> I could hardly contain the joy in my heart. Jesus had spoken to me. It all came to pass by trying to obey, endeavoring to read and pray for God's servant, Brother Lauren Ham. I will never get over it. Glory, may she never get over it. Why, when Jesus tells you to ask, brother, you and the and, and heaven opens, it's time to go for glory and get your petitions up there by God's grace and mercy. I will never get over it. It's too good to be false. What I like that. Hallelujah. It will only be by God's grace if I can continue today or tomorrow, but doors have been opened and I am trusting his mercies are new every day. It's a shock to any pastor that we never come to the place of awakening. But there have been people who have been with me 20 years that didn't know the first thing I... Does, they don't know the first thing I've said, really. The first spiritual principle. Because learning from Jesus doesn't come in the head. It must come in the heart. And I have quoted it over and over again. Page 64, E. Stanley Jones... We learn as we obey and in no other way. Years ago, I told the, old, the old early church, uh, first church over there, I said, now that God's ordained this revival meeting. I think it's Brother Gutenfeld's meeting. If you come every night, God will, ch if you're not used to coming, you come every night, God will do something to change your life. There was a mother here who had a young boy in a t team, either baseball or football. I don't know. And she'd always gone on Wednesday night to see him play. And she thought, well, how can I miss that? But she said, the pastor said well, I should be here. She said, I'll just try it. See if it works. I want you to know she came every night. You know what happened to her? God sanctified her. I said, if you'll come and be faithful to Jesus, God will help you and sanctify you. You see, it was quite a word I had spoken. And I want you to know God changed her life. And I want you to know he started sanctification within her heart. And she just did what I said. You, you'd think that people would hear all the time. Very few here. 
And so we have to be very careful because uh, people think that we're cult leaders or something like that. We just have to be gentle, and God wants us to be. But when someone hears, isn't it wonderful? Oh, it's a great thing. Hallelujah. I'm so glad that Jesus spoke to my heart, and he said, come and pray. I'm so glad that Jesus has helped me to be faithful to that, and only by his grace can I continue to be faithful. I'm so glad for a congregation that has... I believe, been happy with that calling. So thankful for each one of you who, who have prayed for me and prayed for God's servant and uh, who are waiting on God. In his book, in the chapter on waiting, he says, if you'll just start with 15 minutes, read and pray. And then he said, listen. So I pray about two hours, read the scriptures, 10 to 20 chapters, and then I and I read some in a voice or some other book on prayer. And then I just fold everything up and I listen. And I listen. That's the first two hours. And then I try to get ready. And all the while I'm pleading the blood and praying. Then I make my way to the upper room of prayer. And all I've had for almost a year is a wall to pray by. But that's all I've needed. And Jesus said, if you'll come and pray by this wall, I'll take care of all things. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. And now we know that after next Sunday, we'll, Monday, we'll go to London and come back. After two weeks, we return for the celebration of our 20th anniversary, uh, which is a great day by God's grace, July 2nd. Then on July 3rd or 4th, probably the 3rd, we make our way back to enter the upper room with from four to, or from two, three to seven or eight, sometimes 10 to 12 men. And there we pray and we pray and we pray. I, I said, Jesus, you want me to share this morning, make a way. And he just made a way. And see, the service is young. See how he gave us a young service. Now listen, when Jesus said, this is important because I don't know when I'll get to say it again. All services in this church are now dismissed until next Sunday morning. So hear me. We're not coming back till next Sunday. Great silence, but may it be a blessed silence, a blessed quietness. May you either be at home with your families or may you be, if you need to go somewhere, there's a place called Maranatha. There's another place called Bell where my brother Terry preaches. I don't know. Maybe there's some other man of God that needs you somewhere that you can help and lift them up. But I thought I'd tell you that so you could hear me plainer by God's grace. When Jesus said, when he gave us the unjust judge as an example, what you may not have recognized is that many people see God as an unjust guy, judge. When he gave us, this is that when he was exhorting us on importunity, when he gave us the example of the friendly, unfriendly neighbor at night that couldn't get out of bed because his children and cattle in the way. And they needed bread because hospitality is, a, is absolutely a must in the East. And he, and he gave them that example. And when he, when he said that sometimes the, the, the problem looks as big as a mountain when you're, in the, when you're in Israel, that's the biggest thing you can look at, Mount Hermon. That's a big problem. He was giving us what seems to be to many people. Oh, he went on to say, if you being evil will give bread instead of stones to your children, and if you give fish instead of scorpions, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask for him? Which means that the, that the desire of the disciples to be filled with the Holy Spirit just like you and like me. But he went on to say, whatever, keep on asking, keep on seeking, and keep on knocking. Now that tells us this, and I won't preach a whole sermon on this, but I don't know when I'll be before you. There's only one, there's only one thing that can stop what's our goal and our destiny, and that's inconstancy in prayer. 
The praying man cannot be stopped. The praying man, the regularly praying man will be filled with the Holy Spirit and all that he needs in life will come to him. But if, he, if he's infrequent in prayer, forget it, it is lost. There's only one thing can stop you. That's if you don't pray. Unjust judge makes no difference. God's better than an unjust judge. Unfriendly neighbor, friendly, unfriendly neighbor makes no difference. As big as, uh, as uh, Mount Hermon, which never yet has been cast in the sea, yet he said the faith of a grain of mustard seed would, would do it. But he said, in essence, he's saying nothing can stop the man that prays. There's one thing that will stop you. In frequent prayer. That's it. That's first sermon here this morning. For the man that will get on his knees, and that's why we've pled for prayer. That's what God's been teaching his prayer. For the man that will get on his knees, it's so arranged in the fabric of this universe that the man that will get on his knees, there's nothing can stop him. There's nothing can stop the will and purpose of God. He may refine your desires. He may show you what you're like on your knees, and that's what he'll do. He won't show you what your brother's like. He'll show you what you're like. But I'm telling you, stay on your knees. I want you to know God will remove the main obstacle, and that's self-assertiveness. God will remove the carnal nature, and that's been the problem all along. It's not been the wife after all. It's not been the husband after all. It's not been the children. It's not been the job. It's not been the lack of anything. Brother, the answer's been, you've not been on your prayer. So these essentials are exactly that. I've been trying to think of another word. What in the word is another word for essentials? Because it's going over our heads. I'll find one after a while. You keep praying for me. But here's, a, here's what God has shown us in prayer. Nothing, absolutely nothing can stop the man and the woman that stays on their knees before God and prays. And that explains why those two women in that village, and they were too old and too sick to get out of their place. So they just knelt and prayed for revival in the village. Knelt and prayed, knelt and prayed, knelt and prayed, knelt and prayed. Eighteen years went by in one day. God sent a man in there and didn't know hardly why he was in there. But with him came a revival that swept that city and saved nearly every person in the place. And when they got to trying to find the reason why and searched out all the reasons, they finally got back to two old women who were on their knees in the parlor. We've often been heard to say, if you can't do anything else, pray. Oh, my Lord and my God, don't do anything but pray. Then do whatever God tells you. But until you've got that lesson, you don't need to be doing anything at all. Moody went over, Moody went over to England and he found himself in a place and he was visited. He was going over there to hear the great Spurgeon. He was over here to hear the great over He was in an audience and they asked him, uh, when he went in, they asked him to get up and preach at a certain place. When he got up and preached, the Holy Ghost came in power. And so they said, uh, they said, Pastor Moody, what are we going to do? There's so many people responding. He said, well, take them downstairs. Maybe they've misunderstood. So he, he said, everybody that needs to be saved and re- needs the blood of Jesus, go downstairs. Well, hundreds went down there. And Moody, they said, we don't know what to do. Well, see, God's Spirit came with Moody and convicted men and women who thought they were Christian. A lot of people think they're sanctified when they're just getting saved. They've been practicers and performers, but as long as the self-life is reigning, you can't be sanctified. God has to save a man first. And when he saves a man, then he makes him a candidate for sanctification. People were just getting saved. They've been in the church for years. And he, and he went up there, and so Moody, Moody went off somewhere, and, and, and they had to call him back. Because in, the, in a visit in the afternoon, the, the, uh, uh, the pastor found a woman who said, I was so startled this morning, I didn't know what to do. She said, several years ago, I saw Mr. Moody's picture. And she said, I've been praying for years that God had sent him to this place and with him sent a revival. And said, I went to church this morning, and there he was, and here was the revival. Well, the pastor called him and said, Mr. Moody, get back here. You're the man she's been praying for. Moody came back, and God sent revival to London. And he said, and he saved hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and so Mr. Moody didn't even know it God just used him to get over there because he's so humble to get under the feet of one of God's servants boy if you'll keep criticism out of your soul and look to Jesus when the storms blow there's not a thing in the world can keep the answer from coming in your life but one thing the lack of prayer 
And so prayerlessness is a sin. Hallelujah. We can get on our knees and cry to Jesus and plead the blood. Hallelujah. And pray that God will. My prayers are the devil's against it. When the devil was thrown out of heaven at the ascension, it said, heaven rejoice. Why? He was thrown out of heaven. Hallelujah. Michael and his angels came against him and we said the man child was swept out beside the throne and it said Satan, the dragon and his angels were cast out this first time in 4,000 years. He'd been up there accusing you and me day and night. Why? Because the evidence was right beside God. Your sins and my sins had never been dealt with. But when the blood of God was shed and, the, and said he was, man child was swept up there, suddenly the devil who had been putting his finger on us for all those years, his evidence was gone. His authority was gone. And then Michael came against him and he was cast down. So what does it say? It says, have a great time, heaven. But what does it say about you and me? It says, woe unto the inhabitants of the earth. The battle's here. But we overcome just like Michael did and just like the martyrs did. For right in the middle of that chapter, this is sermon number two this morning. Right in the middle of that chapter, it says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. They never put themselves first even to martyrdom. Isn't that great? Oh, I got the devil out of heaven last week. I was so happy. Now, don't be offended with me. Some of you don't have that background. I don't have it either. I just read the book. <laughs> and you don't, have to, you don't have to interpret that. It's as plain as the nose on your face. The woman gave, the church of God gave birth to the man child. That's Jesus. You say, well, Mary did. But you know that that's not just Mary because she has offspring and that's us. You that know the book of Revelation. I've never touched it before, but I had a time with it last Sunday. Blessed be God forevermore. And there was the devil been pointing at your sins and my sins day and night. What, look what he told Eve. He said, Eve, he said, surely God doesn't mean what he says. You'll not die. Well, he's a lying to her. She did die. She died an awful death and brought an awful curse upon herself and off of Adam. But he got up beside God and he said, kill her. Why? Because the soul that sinneth shall die. The wages of sin is death. And the only way for that to ever have been satisfied was that Jesus became the loving sacrifice. He was the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And when He shed His blood for us, something happened to your sins and my sins. It was just like a holy blip. They were gone. And he, what He was pointing at, He couldn't point any longer. See, Look back at God and you see there's no evidence. What happened? The blood of Christ took it all away. The Old Testament says they were put in the deep of the sea. I'm going to tell you something. You can drain the ocean dry and you'll not find a sin there. Said it's removed as far as the east is from the west. I want to tell you something. You can get all the way to one or the other. They're not there. That's Old Testament. In the New Testament, my friend, they're gone, 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 gone. They're removed from the universe. They're not even behind the back of God. The blood of Jesus took them all away. Therefore, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. My sins, yes. Your sins, yes. Say, preacher, you're preaching with authority only because of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Only because Jesus said, preach this one. I'd have left a long time ago. My failures are so great. My sins are so great. If it weren't for the blood, I couldn't continue. I couldn't get up and go again. But I want you to know, he's given me strength to get up and go again. And what I'm saying is truth anyway. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, we'll have our soloists come and sing, and and then I'll try to preach. (laughs) You're going to be surprised because it's along the same line. Dismissing is because the Savior gave us the example. He said, come, come apart a little while and rest. And some of our leaders and teachers are just worked to, the, are just worked to a frazzle. 
So by God's grace, we're going to rest till next Sunday. Is that all right? Now, I've only missed service and torn, dismissed in all of these years, except for the, when that snow came in, to, even with that, two or three times. So I'm not one given to dismissals. Uh, we're going to dismiss till next Sunday morning and praise God, obey Him. Be, be sure and have your family devotions. Keep in touch with Jesus and come back with the victory next Sunday. Praise the Lord.
and I know that I have thrown stones. I sent Joshua after Brother Morgan's first sermon on throwing stones. I sent him out to the yard to find me some rocks, and he brought back some rocks, very small ones. I looked at him, I thought, oh God, mine are much bigger than I've thrown. And we stopped along the side of a road beside the river, and we picked up some that were this big. They would fit in my pocket. <laughs> but I thought, mine are bigger than that. You know, a real stone is big that you throw and they hurt. <laughs> and I'm, I've thrown stones at parents of my children and of the students. I've thrown stones. And I am sorry. I've thrown stones at Pastor Rod and Pastor Barry and Marlene and Faye. The people that I work with, I've thrown stones. <laughs> I've thrown stones at Sally and David and at my son <laughs> and the people that I work with. <laughs> and it's like, I, I'm not depressed, and I'm, but I get discouraged sometimes. And, and I look in the faces of the students and I... Sometimes I get so discouraged. But Friday night, it was like, oh God, look what you've done. I can remember when David Perry, Crockett Perry came in here as a seventh grader, little Crockett Perry, but short and big Crockett Perry grew up to be tall and handsome, that Crockett Perry, and what he said was so wonderful. I mean, it was just so wonderful. It made it, it was like, it's worth it all. <laughs> And I know I don't pray enough. I know I don't. But sometimes I get such joy when I pray still for Karen Mullins yeah. or Michael Hammond or Randy Bright yeah. or Tony and Brian. I mean, it's, sometimes I get so blessed and yet I don't pray enough for just every day, every day. Every day I just, I lose the vision. It's there in my heart, but... Yeah. It's like, oh, get it away. Yes. yes. But it's six o'clock this morning. I was so blessed when on Friday in my mailbox there was a tape. Four of the students did a tape. And a parent from our school and then just a friend did a tape for the teachers. In one of the songs, Blessed Be the Tide That Binds, it was so wonderful. I just cried because it was just so anointed and so, and I just wept. And then I woke David up and I said, Oh, David, you've got to listen to this. That's good, that's but I'm sorry. Yeah. But you see, that, that song that that child played was a prayer for the teachers. And you see, I felt it, even though sometimes, sometimes I aggravate you parents. I understand I'm a parent. I get aggravated. You know, I do. I don't want to. And I know you don't want to. I'm babbling on. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. That's a great thing. So you're one of the most childlike people I've ever met in my life. But you see, I... I look at that child that was playing that song and sometimes I think, oh, is she ever going to make it? You know, oh, are they going to make it? I would just like to take them and do this and this and this. But then look at David Perry. Oh, it's so <laughs> wonderful. I mean, they will. Our prayers that we pray now for these children, don't worry about them. They're going to make it. That's Maybe right. they have to go through this and this and I this and it. this. Yes. I don't know why they had to go through this I and this it. and this and this, Me but they're too. going to make it because we're praying for them. That's right. They're going to make it. That's it. Chuck, they're That's gonna it. Make it. They're going to do it. Thank you, Lord. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, it's wonderful. That's wonderful. And the blood of Christ has cleansed us by God's grace and by God's mercy. Thank you, Father. Praise His holy name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Savior. Thank you, Lord, for this love. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.